can you tell us a bit about like the story, like how Hopeful started and, and why? Yeah. Well, Hopeful started really as an idea as I was doing, uh, it was right after I graduated from the University of Toronto for my computer science and development degree. Uh, and this was just about three years ago now. And essentially what we quickly noticed was that there was uh, a huge amount of gaps in terms of how data was being used in the nonprofit space. And there was a recognition that they really needed to digitize. And this was before COVID happened. So we really spent our first year and a half, as I mentioned, uh, getting to the bottom of that and doing research. So we essentially were interviewed 150 nonprofits. We started the ideas kind of being a CRM or a data management pipeline. Mm -hmm. But over time, it became apparent that the thing that was really missing in the space was something to handle social media, but handle it in the specifically nonprofit and impact way. So there is no one that does what we do in the nonprofit and impact space. And that's, we basically reverse engineered hopeful from product market fit interviews into what it is today. How was that? Like you were on vacation and, and you just uh, met him and decided to start it? Or? Yeah, basically that. I was on oh. vacation in Northern India. Um, I used to do, uh, I used to be a chef back in the day as well. Uh, so I was doing some research on a cookbook I was writing several years ago. And then my co-founder and I saw on cross paths while we were in India. Uh, and then we've been working remotely together ever since. Uh, he's been in the process of coming over to Canada for a while, but obviously as a result of the pandemic, mm. it's been, it's been a tough go, but uh, yeah, me and him get along great. And that's a very remote based co-foundership. How, how's that? Do you think it works well or yeah, well, it's definitely, it definitely is unique, especially those specific time zones. There's a 10 and a half hour, 11 hour difference. So we definitely had to get used to it, but we've gotten used to it and it works for us uh, now, especially on the tech team, which is the most split between Toronto uh, and India and Pakistan. That was an interesting go uh, for myself. My, our sales and marketing team is all in the US and Canada. So I had an easier bit of a day to day than my co-founder did, but it works well for us now or aspiring entrepreneurs should start in sales because that will help them, um, you know, sell their, their product or idea? Well, I would never make that blanket assumption, but I definitely have seen that having a sales background and being able to talk is tremendously helpful, especially if you are going after a venture-backed business. Um, but as always, if you have your own skill set and your own talent, focus on your skill set and your talent. That's what finding a co-founder is for right? Yeah. That's what finding your team is for us to fill those gaps in. Uh, that is always very helpful, but it's also equally as helpful to be able to code. So if you are missing a skill, don't try to force yourself to learn a skill that you're not going to be, you're going to be inherently weaker at. I would definitely find a co-founder you work well with who can fill that skill for you. Any sales skills you use to, to raise uh, funding? Uh, well, of course, you have to know how to pitch, you know, yeah. how to handle objections, you have to know how to sell your company. It's all sales. Venture funding is sales. It's just a bigger dollar, now, a bigger deal. It's like enterprise sales is like a, what, what I usually equate it to. What we always learned is ventures and numbers. You're going to get as you're going to get many, many, many no's, no matter what kind of a business you're in. So you just have to be comfortable with failure. Don't keep going back to the same well. There's so many venture capital funds, angel funds. There's so many different sources of funding. You just have to keep going after all of it and see what ends up being a good fit. That's all it is. It's really just creating that pipeline and making that effort. And it's as simple as that. If I had any kind of like pearls of wisdom, I would give it, but it's just that basic is go after it, go have as many conversations as you have and it'll work out. So we've definitely done quite a few jumps. Um, we haven't done any kind of hard pivots, but that's because we spent the first year and a half just figuring out what our fit was. And if we hadn't done that first year and a half, there would have been a lot more hard pivoting involved. Startups is one of the craziest rides you'll ever have as a career. So it's the same as like, if you get a question, where do you see yourself five years from now? We never thought we'd see yeah. a pandemic come from nowhere, right? So. Mm -hmm. I can't give an answer to that question because if I knew that answer, then my job wouldn't be as exciting as it is. It's you yeah. got to be able to lean back and just really control what you can control for and then just kind of let the journey go by. So I have no idea. I have really no idea. And I'm just excited to see how it plays out. Yeah. What would you do different? Um, I would definitely have done more studying in terms of pricing and how one actually monetizes effectively right out of the gate. 
Uh, we did a lot of work on what was the product need, but not the actual distribution strategy. Um, we ended up building a great go-to-market, but the monetization on that go-to-market was something we quickly had to do a lot of work on. So I would have done a lot of that and really expanded the way I did my product market fit questions um, and really made sure that everything foundationally in terms of like your HR, your accounting, all those kinds of things, we really flew by the seat of our pants on that for a long time. And that caused a lot of annoying evenings and a lot of hiccups. That's something that getting those foundational things done, even with like cheap and easy technology right out of the gate saves you so much time as a, as a startup founder. And it's always important to focus on that. So yeah, foundational elements and make sure you got your pricing right before you launch. In terms of down moments, we've definitely come flirted a few times with running out of runway, especially in the early MVP days. Those are really not fun moments and you have to get really creative. And those are really when you have, um, some of the most exciting times in a startup. And I think our best moment was probably either our acceptance into UC Berkeley Skydeck, which is one of the best accelerators in the world, or our partnership with the British Columbia Hospice and Palliative Care Association, which is one of the largest hospice and palliative care associations in the world. Uh, and we essentially provide our services to hospices and palliative care centers, as well as children's hospitals in the entire province of British Columbia, which is something we're very proud of. Was it your plan to get into accelerators at the beginning or it just happened? To, to well, the Ryerson DMZ uh, is kind of our local town uh, accelerator incubator. Um, and it's one of the best incubators in the world for very early stage companies. Um, I personally got, our plan was to think about accelerators, but we got really lucky because uh, I knew a lot of the founders who were in the DMZ. It got recommended to be highly when we we're in the very early days. Uh, and the sign of a good incubator is if you make those connections before you go in and they help you on your early stage. And that's really what they did. Uh, and then with Skydeck, that was already when we were farther along, we had revenue in place. So that was more of a traditional interview process, tightening up the pitch and then really making sure that we could again, sell ourselves as to why we should belong. And then we are one of, uh, 14 companies, I believe chosen out of several thousand applicants. So. That was something that was a big high moment, as I mentioned as well. But again, it comes down to selling. You need to sell the vision of where things are going. And that's more than VCs, I would say, and other funding sources for accelerators because they help you all the way through. So would you recommend young entrepreneurs to target accelerators, like to get in, to try to get into an accelerator? I would definitely say an incubator is awesome if you have one available. And that's what I'm talking about, like your very, very early stages when you need the most guidance, especially if it's your first time. Uh, that helped me a lot. This is my first company that I founded. Uh, on the accelerator side, that depends. If you're growing like a rocket ship already, maybe you don't necessarily need it. But if you're going out to like the, the West Coast and you're going to the Valley, those are some of the best way to build connections that you wouldn't be able to get easily on your own. So that one's a judgment call, but I do always, I always can recommend uh, an incubator personally with Skydeck. Absolutely love them. Absolutely love the DMZ team. We're still in touch with both teams regularly. So that's, it's a special place in my heart, but incubators for sure. If it's your first time, accelerators, depends. Generally the cadence is once you reach out the first time you have the first call, you follow up two days, five days a week, and then make a judgment call from there but we always make sure to have our weekly newsletter. We have events regularly once a month. It's if you start feeling like you're spam, you're probably spam. That's the rule. Yeah.